Love this chapter. It's tremendous. Got a lot of information. And uh, we'll read several verses. I kind of want to let you know where I'm, where I'm headed. Is uh, in dealing with some, the list of what Paul calls the works of the flesh. We're going to get there, but I want to start at verse 1 and just, and just take us through a process because we've been dealing with the topic of love, but love is not always what people think of uh, in terms of, of uh, common understanding or connotation. You know what? It, it doesn't really matter what the world says love is. We need to find out what the Bible says love is and then do it God's way. Amen? So we need, a, we need a strong biblical understanding because the scripture says that God is love. It's his essence. It's his nature. The very essence of someone or something is their spirit. And when you reduce God to his core, that very core existence, that being, the part of him that makes him who he is, is love. And the Bible never says that God is faith. He has faith, but it never says he is faith. But the Bible does say God is love. And if you look time after time after time, the Apostle Paul says that love is to be our highest aim. I show you a more excellent way or a most excellent way, and that way is the walk of love. Well, I'd submit to you this, that if God is love, and obviously the scripture says that he is, so we agree with that, but God being love, it is synonymous with, love is synonymous with his spirit. So if you're going to walk in the spirit, to walk in the spirit is to walk in the love of God. And to manifest the fruit of the spirit is to manifest his nature, and that nature is love. Love is the principle or the first fruit of the Spirit. By this shall all men know that you're my disciples because that you have love one to another. And the kind of love that God has for us is an extravagant love. It's a love that goes way beyond bounds, way beyond limitations. It's outrageous love. It's extreme love. It's extravagant love. And we talked in another session about the woman with the alabaster box she hacked the disciples off. They were indignant, the Bible says. These guys were upset. And you know what? Jesus talked about how that she had an extravagant love. Their, their comments, the disciples' comments in their anger were such that they called her gift a waste. Well, you know what that is? It's one of the definitions of the word extravagant. To be extravagant is to be wasteful. It's just like I heard uh, John Avancini talk about waiting for his wife in the parking lot one day uh, of some mall, and, and uh, he noticed that there was this flower, just a single flower growing up through a crack in the, in the asphalt. And then, there, then there was this, just a deluge, a frog strangler, as some people say in Texas. It really started to rain, just poured, poured sheets of rain. And God spoke to Brother Avancini and said, I'm just watering my flower. Well, that's the way God does things. He does things exceeding, overabundant. I mean, he just goes, he just goes to the extreme in love. And the scripture talks even in the Old Testament about how that uh, he keeps his eye on you and how he's graven his people on the palm of his hand. And it's just like, it, it's as if it were to say he's, he carries your picture around but it's tattooed on his hand. So every time he looks down at his hand, he sees you. Isn't that awesome? That's how much God loves you. And this, you know, the scripture just talks over and over again about this, how much God loves us, his, his loving kindness, his mercy, tender mercies are new every morning. And uh, when you think about it, he loves every one of us so much that he's been watching us since we were knit together in our mother's womb. Isn't that what the scripture says? It says, while you were being formed, in your mother's womb. Uh, you, know how, you know how maybe some of you moms, right, have a memory book and things that your child says are, are in there? Well, 
the scripture, if you read it in the New Living, the, Psalm 139, if you read it in the New Living, uh, it talks about how every day of your life was recorded before you ever saw the light of day. So God's not just, he's just not watching what you say and then recording it. He does that too, according to the book of Malachi. There is a book of remembrance being said of the things that we speak to one another. But God did his memory book before you were ever born. That's how much he loves you. Every day he recorded what you say and what you did. You know, I've talked before about how that mothers like to take a little lock of their hair, maybe when that baby gets the first haircut, and then they tape it in that little memory book. But God's not like that. He's extravagant. He goes way over and above in proving his love for us because he not only keeps a little lock of the hair, he doesn't do that, but the scripture says that all the hairs of your head are numbered. You know, I used to look at that scripture and think, well, God knows the number of hairs on your head. And then he nudged me one day and said, no, I didn't say that. I said all the hairs of your head are numbered. You know, it's almost like he's got a little... Uh, it's almost like he's got a little tool that has inscribed a number on every hair. You know, when you ladies are brushing your hair, there's an angel that says, well, we lost number 3,091 today. It's no longer with us. But you know what? He is, yeah. If, if some of your ladies' hair turns a little gray, you pull that one out. There goes 2,001. But the fact of the matter is that's how much God loves us. You know, he knows when one sparrow gives up the ghost. That's, that's how much love and care he has. But he has infinitely more love and care for his creation, man. Every thought, every plan, every day, Jesus, every waking moment, and he never sleeps, so that's all the time, is spent interceding for you and I. He cannot keep his eyes off of you. He can't stop talking to the Father about you. He ever liveth to make intercession for you. I mean, there's a conversation going on around the throne room today talking about how are we going to bless her tomorrow morning? How are we going to get this blessing through to them? How are, we going to, how are we going to help them? You know what? Everything in the kingdom of God, everything in the word of God is for you, and it's a product of God's love. He told Israel, he said, I didn't choose you because you were more in number than anybody else. You were the fewest in number. I chose you because I loved you. And you know what? That's the same, that's the same way he feels for us today. You know, sometimes we can feel like when we mess up that God kind of turns his back on us, but that's not true. That is not true. He already knew everything we'd ever do, good and bad, when Jesus went to the cross. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the earth. When, when Jesus went to the cross, he already took care of everything that's already happened. And I've got news for you. He's already taken care of everything that will happen. Amen. Why? Because he loves you. He cares for you. you Man, there, there is nothing but good. The curse has been removed. That leaves only the blessing. Yes. And you know what? There is nothing too good for a child of God. You're a joint heir with Jesus. He's given, he has given you a place of authority, raised you to be seated at the right hand of the Father. That's extravagant love. I mean, when the psalmist said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? What are we that you even think about us? You know what that should be? That should be our thought. Because when we consider how much he loves us, we should be just totally blown away in our thinking. He said, God, how could, how could you love me? You know what? He knows you still loves you. Isn't that awesome? Now, if he was willing to die for you while you were yet a sinner, how much more... How much more does he love you and want to bless you now? If he wouldn't cast you out when you didn't even love him, why would he cast you out now that he has spent the blood of his son for you? See, he's not going to do it. There's therefore now no condemnation to those who walk in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. None at all. You know what? Any time that there's any thought in your heart that's, that wants to shove you away from God or make you feel unworthy, Understand the origin of that thought is not God. The origin of any thought that tends to push you away from God, make you feel unworthy, is not from God. Period. You say, well, Mark, you don't know what I've done. You're right, I don't know, but God does know, and he did know when Jesus went to the cross. That means it's already taken care of. Isn't that awesome? Why did he do that? 
The reason he created man, because he had a desire for a family. Some, a family, a group of people who would love him back, not because they had to, but because they wanted to. Isn't that awesome? That is so liberating that it brings us to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Are you there? Galatians chapter 5. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, obviously, Paul's readers were so tied up in the whole issue of circumcision and religion and trying to do things to get God to love them, but he's saying, look, those of you who have been made free in my love, you are set free. You don't have to try to impress me. I love you, period, as Pastor Bob Nichols says. And he said, don't ever go back and be entangled again in the yoke of trying to live by performance. You just keep moving in the grace of God and in the love of God. Don't get tangled up in trying to approach God through your own means. Just be free. This word liberty here means to do as one pleases. It means to, to have license. It means a freedom to choose. And folks, I want to always buffer the message of liberty with this, that true liberty is living as we should, not as we please. We're free to do the will of God. Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me. And one of the things he said he was anointed to do was to set at liberty those or them that are bruised. That means liberty here is a different word and it means to forgive or pardon or to give remission for penalty. It means to release from imprisonment. You know what, if God did that for us, we ought to do that for one another. If he came and was anointed to release people from bondage, to give freedom and liberty and to give forgiveness, then we ought to do the same thing because the scripture says that we should imitate God as dear children. We should be imitators of him. We should mimic him. And folks, what he's talking about is walking in love. Liberty, the release from bondage. Freedom. Romans chapter 8, 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. You know what? That ought to be our confession. I'm free from the law of sin and death. I am not bound to sin. Listen to me. You're not bound to sin. There's liberty. Why? God has provided it for us because of his love. We've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. I don't have to sin anymore. I'm not bound to sin. I'm free from sin. Thank you, Jesus. Now, 1 Corinthians 6, 12, all things are lawful to me, but Paul puts this disclaimer. Now, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be back in Galatians chapter 5, so... Don't try to look everything up. But Paul says, all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. You know what expedient means? How many of you know what expedient means? It means to contribute. If something's expedient, it contributes. It helps. So he's saying, look, I'm free. The loss, the loss, I'm free from the law. I'm free from sin. There's nothing, that, there's nothing unlawful for me, but not, not everything is expedient. Does, does what you're doing help you? Can you do what you're doing or what you want to do and stay free? Does it add to anything? Does it work? Is it right? If it does, it's expedient. Paul goes on to say, I'll not be brought under the power of anything. You know, folks, the things of the Spirit liberate us. Are you listening to me? They unshackle, they unfetter of us. They unfetter us. The things of the flesh chain us, bind us, addict us. But where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there's freedom. Hallelujah. Therefore, I conclude this. We're free from sin. We're not free to sin. Right. Right. Hallelujah. Right. We don't have to sin anymore. Amen. Man, everything in the Spirit of God, everything in the Word of God, young people, has taken us toward freedom. 
Anything that limits that freedom, you know, comes from the enemy. And every work of the flesh tends towards bondage, not liberty. Back in Galatians chapter 5, he said, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Verse 6, For in, Christ, in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but what? Faith which worketh by love. Isn't that amazing? He said, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now let's skip down here a couple of verses. Verse 13 says, For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, folks, the reason I wanted to, to back up and start with verse 1 and talk about liberty and pound that is simply this. You are free to choose the course of love in every situation and circumstances if you will. You do not have to respond in anger. If you respond in anger, you've chosen to respond in anger. If you, if you are tonight, if you're in unforgiveness or you're in strife with another person, part of the body of Christ or a member of your family, it's because you've chosen to be in strife. You're not bound to sin. You're not bound to allow the flesh to dominate you anymore. You have been set free, and you're free to choose your course from here on. There's a freedom in the Spirit of God. Kenneth West said this, he said, when this love becomes the deciding factor in a person's choices, the motivating power in his actions, he will be walking in love. It's a choice. It's a deliberate course of action. Deliberate choice. Hallelujah. It's getting awfully quiet here at Calvary Cathedral International on this Sunday night. Just trying to make it plain. Yes, ma'am. It says, for brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. You know, this word occasion is, is an interesting word to me. It actually is a military word that means base of operations. Don't make your liberty a base of operations for the flesh. You know, there are a whole lot of people that are like that. I'm free. You know, I'm forgiven. God will forgive me for anything, so I can be just as nasty and ugly to you and mean and grumpy as I want to, and then I'll just, I'll just cast it all on the grace of God. How many of you know we ought to, we ought to be growing beyond that? I mean, the, the more we walk with Jesus, the more we should be like him. Amen. He said, be ye holy, for I'm holy. You hang around God, you're going you're gonna to have some holy thoughts. You walk with God, you're going you're gonna to have some godly wisdom coming out of you. If you have a heart full of love for God, then your mouth is going to open. Every time it opens, we're going to get glimpses of the glory of God. But you know what? If every time you open your mouth, we just see your flesh manifest, well, that tells us something about you. Don't use your liberty, this liberty that Jesus purchased, as a, as a base of operations for the flesh. but by love serve one another. See, folks, that love is always going to manifest itself in words and actions. And I would, I would rather err on the, on the action side. Yeah. You know why? Words are cheap. And unless our words of I love you, I esteem you, I appreciate you, unless those words are backed up with action, that you're, not going to be, you're not going to be believed very long. Your actions will betray you because actions speak louder than... But words are important, aren't they? Sure they're important. You don't want to be like that man that the pastor talks about that went in for counseling. The counselor talked to him about telling his wife that he loved her. And the, the man's response was, well, I told her I loved her when we got married. If anything changes, I'll let her know. Words are important, but you know what? It's got to be backed up with action. Let us not love in word alone, but in deed and in truth. You know what? Love seeks to serve. 
Love is unselfish. Love will prefer, love will defer to someone else. Love will go the extra mile and it will just be glorious, not grievous. And you know what? You can't demand that kind of love from anyone. But I know this, the more you sow unconditional love, the greater the response of favor will be in your life. You, know, you can't demand that somebody love you. You can't make somebody love you. And that's never, that's never the order that this, that this thing is put in. God just says, you love. You just, you just love and keep loving. You make your love like mine, unconditional. You keep forgiving. You keep releasing. Why? You, you're never going to go to God and get a negative response when you say, I'm sorry, I blew it. He's not going to turn his nose up, turn his back on you, give you the cold shoulder. He'll never be like that. You know what? Then you, then you need to be just like him. You need to imitate his kind of love. And it goes strong in the word of God. If you don't forgive, Jesus said, I'm not going to forgive you. He said, Mark, you don't know what happened to me. Well, you know what? Your worst day could never have been like what Jesus went through on his, on his way to the cross. And if he were able to stand or to, to be there on that cross and say, Father, forgive them, then you know what? Anything, that, anything that's gone on in your life has, has just paled by comparison. I mean, your worst day was not anything like what Jesus went through. And you say, well, that's Jesus. He's the Son of God. Well, you've got the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. You're a son or a daughter of God. But you know what? I know that there's another biblical example of the very same thing when Stephen was being stoned. Think about that. Think about the tremendous torturous pain that would be and the hate of religion. I mean, there's nothing more demonic and hateful than religion that will kill somebody and, think it, and, and, and blame it on God, yeah. think they're doing God a favor. But Stephen was looking in the face of hate and he was able to say, Father, forgive them. You know what? That, that, puts, that puts the whole thing about your aunt not showing up for your birthday on a whole different plane, doesn't it? It hurts, I know, but... But the fact is this. Folks, if Jesus has forgiven people, then we need to forgive people. If Jesus has forgiven you then I need to forgive you. If Jesus has forgiven me, and we know he has, then you just need to forgive me. And we just need to walk in forgiveness. You know why? Because if we don't, we are running absolutely contrary to the Spirit of God. God gives grace to the humble. He resists the proud. There isn't anybody more proud than somebody who will say, I know what the Word of God says, but... I know what the Word of God says, but. You know what? Anytime you talk about, well, I've forgiven them, but. I love them, but. You know what? That but just negated the love of God in your life. Okay? Because that's no longer unconditional. The love of God is given without condition. It's given without regard for whether somebody deserves it. It gives it without regard to whether it's reciprocated. The love of God just keeps on loving, just keeps on serving, no matter what the response is. You can slap love and love will just turn the other cheek, say, have at it, help yourself, knock your socks off, if that makes you happy. Okay, and you'll have to look back at tape 101 to find there's a disclaimer on that. I'm not suggesting that a wife should allow themselves to be beat up, just go get the rest of the DVDs or whatever. But the fact of the matter is, you just keep on loving. You just keep on forgiving. You just keep on blessing. That's awesome. You know, there was, there was a pastor during the American Revolution. His name was Peter Miller. And uh, he, had a, he had an enemy in his town, and his name was Michael Whitman. Michael Whitman did everything he possibly could to humiliate Pastor Miller. But there came a time when Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to death. And I love this story. Pastor Miller walked 70 miles to talk to his good friend on behalf of this traitor. His good friend happened to be General George Washington. So he comes, meets with Washington, and begins to ask for the life of his enemy, Michael Whitman. 
And uh, the response from George Washington was, I cannot give you the life of your friend. And I love Pastor Miller's response was, my friend, he is my bitterest enemy. General Washington said, what? You walked 70 miles to save the life of the enemy? He said, he said that puts this thing in a whole different light. He says, I'll grant you your, your friend's life. And so he walked back with Whitman's that 70 miles, no longer with an enemy, but with a friend. You know what that is, folks? That's unconditional love. That's unconditional love. But that's what the love of Christ has done for us. In this was manifested the love of God in that he sent his only begotten son to be a propitiation or sacrifice for our sins. If God so loved us, John said, we ought to. Moral obligation, we ought to love one another. If he loves us that much, we ought to love one another. I like what, the way Kenneth West says that. He says we ought to be constantly loving one another. Well, that's good, Mark. But where do we go from here? Well, I want to talk to you just, just for a few minutes now. And here's the meat of what I want to give you tonight. I want to talk to you about the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. The works of the flesh versus the fruit of the Spirit. Why, why are you talking to me about this, Mark? I'm talking to you about this for the same reason I talked to you tonight during the offering about how worry is serving money. It's one of these issues that a lot of times we can say, oh, I'm walking in love. Oh, I, walk, I, I, I love everybody. But you know what? We're going to see a highlight of these works of the flesh. I've always thought it was kind of humorous to think about this, how, this is, how drastically or how differently these two things are, are uh, shown here. Because think about it. It's the works of the flesh or the fruit of the Spirit. The works versus the fruit. You know, so, a fruit is something that's just produced naturally. Okay, but a work is something that it, it extends labor. It, it inquires, requires toil and energy to be spent. Now, I want you to look at verse 19 with me. Verse 19. Actually, you know what? Let's back up. Let's back up here for just a minute. How am I doing, hon? Is this good? I smiled enough? It's good. That's great. How many of you are under conviction? Okay. Just one, just one lady. She's the one that's going to get free. She's the one that's going to get blessed. Hallelujah. Look at verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if ye be led of the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies. Talking about the works of the flesh now. Galatians chapter 5 verse 21. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such the like, of the which I tell you before and have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Here's the contrast, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law, and they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we live in love, let us also walk in love. Now, let's deal with some things here. I mean, most of us would understand and we'd agree, well, you know, yes, adultery and lasciviousness and those things, and uh, they're obviously works of the flesh. But let's just take a look at this list because m about half of this list deal with interpersonal relationships. About half this list deal with how we respond to one another. And obviously a work of the flesh, too, involves two flesh if you're going to talk about adultery and fornication. So Paul's really, I mean, he's getting down to the nitty-gritty. 
But it impresses me that the works of the flesh have so much to do with how we relate to other people. And so I did a little research and looked up some words in Strong's, not something that you couldn't do on your own, but you know what? We need to let the Word of God examine us. We need to look into this perfect law of liberty like the mirror that it is and let it show up who we really are and where our spiritual development is. You with me? Because we're, we're interested in learning how to walk in love. If you're going to walk in love, you're going to have to crucify the flesh. And the more flesh you crucify, the greater the love walk is going to manifest forth in your life. And I don't know about you, but I want to grow. All spiritual growth is going to cause a growth in the love walk. Because that's the nature of God. So let's jump into this. Is that all right? The word hatred. See, you ask a lot of Christians, do you hate anybody? Oh, I don't hate anybody. But you know what? The word simply means hostility or opposition. Now, if you, want to, if you get down to it, there are a lot of Christians who are opposed to one another. Uh, we're, we get opposed to other people denominationally. And really, there's a spirit of pride in a lot of charismatic people. But you know what? There are a whole lot of people who are non-quote-unquote charismatic that have stronger character more character in their little finger than a lot of people who run around speaking in tongues. That's good. You know, if you, if you speak in tongues and you don't have love, you are nobody. Yeah, right. If you give your body to be burned, it means absolutely nothing if it didn't come from the motive of love. If you have all knowledge, know all mysteries, have the gift of prophecy, but don't, don't operate out of a, a basis of love, it profits nothing. But you know what? You talk to most charismatics. If they cast out a devil, speak in tongues, dance on, you know, dance a little jig, and say Shondai and prophesy over you, charismatics fall down and worship, worship men and worship gifts worse than anybody I ever know. And you know what? We will, charismatics will overlook tremendous character flaws and say, well, they're gifted. So that makes it all right. You know what? It doesn't make it all right. Without love, you are a nobody and a nothing if you, if you can't walk in love. It doesn't matter what gift you operate in. It doesn't matter how strong your anointing is. If your anointing is so strong you can be tacky and rude to people, then you haven't got anything. So he said, don't make, don't make the gifts the chief aim. Make the fruit. Make love your chief aim. You don't think that's right? Look up 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Pursue love. Make it your chief aim. No, Mark, it's all in faith. I'm going to build my faith. Well, if you, don't, if you don't build love, your faith won't work. See, the principal thing is love. And if you have hatred in your heart, it just means you're opposed to somebody. Opposition. The synonym, listen to this, the synonym for hatred is resentment. resentment oh I've forgiven them but I'll never forget what they did I mean you know people that's why it's funny you know people like that man they, another believer walks in the room and they're all like I mean there are people don't point anybody there were there are people that if they see if they see you in the mall they will duck into a store just so they don't have to, just so they don't have to speak to you. You know what that is? That's resentment. And you know what that is? That's hatred. That's what the Bible calls hatred. See, we all think it's just like, I want to kill them. <laughs> that's hatred too. But that's not. That's not all there is. You, if are you opposed to somebody? That's hatred. Biblically, that's what the word means. You resent somebody? That's hatred. See, that'll manifest tomorrow morning, okay, at 7.55, when you should have been at that point by 7.45. That could manifest. You know what that is? That's the spirit of hatred. That gets serious. Cain and Abel got into it over an offering. Variance. Variance. It means a quarrel, contention, and debate. If you're quarrelsome, and contentious, you're at variance. If you're at variance with another believer in particular, but anyone, if you're at variance, that's a work of the flesh. 
That means to the degree that you walk at var in variance, if you walk out of harmony with other people in the body of Christ, you are dominated by the flesh and you are not walking in love. Brother Gary, can you go to the piano and play just as I am? Can you be ready? <laughs> Folks, you know what? Let me, let me tell you something. Look at Brother Mark here for just a second. It's not enough to just get this thing down on the outward in the action area. Until we lose forgiveness in our hearts and stop thinking the ugly thoughts that we think about other people, we are not walking in love. Just because you bite your tongue and you don't say anything anymore does not mean you're walking in love. Love will require a change in your heart, and a change in your heart means you've developed something more of the character of God in your life than you used to have. Variance. Think about it. A quarrel, contention, debate. The opposite, the anonym, is harmony. So if you're in variance, you're out of harmony with other people. And it's beautiful when you have people who just walk in one accord, and it's awesome. You know, there's a group of people that, that just love one another, serve one another, forgive one another, flow with one another. It's awesome. You know what? Even, even, in, even in the business realm, they have done studies. I'm talking about secular corporations, and they, find, they found this, that divisions of companies... Departments and companies that have the greatest amount of unity also have the greatest amount of finances. Because you know what? A house divided against itself cannot stand. A department divided against itself cannot stand. A marriage divided against itself. A home divided against itself cannot stand. But when people are in one place in one accord, powerful things happen. They're not at variance with one another. There's a whole lot of people at variance with one another. I had, I had somebody bend my ear one time because Sunday morning the staff wears coat and tie. And they were all upset because somebody they brought didn't feel comfortable or something. And I'm like, man, you wear a coat and tie. Why didn't you wear a pair of shorts? You know what that is? That's just variance. And that's just opposition. That's out of harmony. Okay, let's move on. Emulations. I mean, what in the world are emulations? You know what? If, if, you, if, you, if you're walking in the spirit of emulations, it means you, you're jealous and you envy. See, if you love me, love is not jealous. If you love me, you cannot be jealous of me. If I love you, I can't envy you. You know, because envy, envy wants to drag you down and wish you were there. Think about that. But you know what? There's envy runs rampant in the, in, in the body of Christ. And even if you've never said it, if it's in your heart, just think of what Jesus said about the guy that looks on a woman to lust after. He says he's already committed adultery. Where? In his heart. So these things can't just be you don't say things. It's got to be from the heart. It's a heart issue. Envy, jealousy. You know what? If I love you, no matter how much you get promoted, I'm cheering you on. That's good. If, I, if I love you, I want to see you advanced. I want to see you more prosperous. I want to see you more anointed. I want to see you with greater success. And if I love you, it will not matter if you, if you pass me up, if you... Get more blessing than me, if you get more opportunity than me, if you preach more than me, if I love you, I cannot envy you. If I'm envious of you, I'm trapped by the flesh. I'm allowing my flesh to work, and obviously I've not crucified the flesh if the flesh is still working. Wrath. Wrath. This is passion in a negative sense. It's fierceness. It's, uh, it's the, the actual word carries this whole idea of, of like breathing hard. You know, somebody gets you, I mean, they really get your goat. And it's just get under my skin. That's wrath. That's a sin. We don't talk a whole lot about sin. We're not sin conscious, but you know what? If you're messing up, you need to straighten yourself up. Wrath is a work of the flesh. Strife. 
Now, most of us think that strife is only argument, but I want you to see the definition of this word. Strife means intrigue, faction. You know, you think about intrigue. Intrigue in the body of Christ is like, I don't know, I don't know what that Charlie Pryor's thinking. I mean, anybody with half a brain ought to know. And you don't do this. And you, you know why? You know why it's intrigue? It's because it's, it's the whisper. It's backbiting. It's a splinter group. Somebody who walks in strife always wants to gather people around them because they know they're wrong. They want to gather people around them with the same wrong opinion so that they think somehow majority rules in the body of Christ. If I can get enough people to drink the same poison I'm drinking, then I can't be wrong because this many people can't be wrong. I mean, you know what? The, the, the way is called straight and narrow because few there be that find it. The majority is going down the wide road, and we know where that ends up. You know what? It's okay if you walk alone. Just stay free from strife. I just thought I'd read James to you. Don't, don't look it up. But James 3.14 says, If you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. The, this wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion in every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. You know, I love, I love, I love what the Word of God has to say. If you really got the goods, you're easy to be entreated. And you find somebody you just can't ask a question to, they're not walking in love. They're dominated by the flesh. Everybody smile and just praise God. Hallelujah, Jesus, we love you. We praise you. It's too hard? Okay, there's going, to be a, there's going to be a quiz at the end. Okay. Seditions. You know what it means if you're, if, you're, if you're involved in seditions or you're seditious? It means disunion, dissension, and division. Disunion, dissension, and division. And we like to, we like to draw those lines. Yeah, we like to draw those lines. It's division. This is my group. This is us, that's them. You know, we don't mix with them, they don't mix with us. You know, we just need to love one another. You know, in the body of Christ, age doesn't make a difference. Whether you're a man or a woman doesn't make a difference. Whether you're old or young doesn't make a difference. We're all drinking from the same fountain. We've all got the same Jesus. We should have the same care one to another. And folks, let me just give you a hint. You are going nowhere fast spiritually if you allow the flesh to dominate you. Amen. Nowhere. The things we're talking about, this, this, the, the works of the flesh will negate the blessings of God in your life. Heresies. Now, see, we would think heresy, well, now that has to do with doctrine, Mark. No, not this, not this word, it doesn't. It means a choice, a party, a sect. It means to prefer one member of the body of Christ above another. You know what? We are supposed to, we are supposed to honor offices. But you know what? Every one of us are cut from the same cloth. Are you listening to me? We honor offices. And you know what? There are men who, who, who we need to respect because of their walk with God. But you know what? You're in heresy if you make a choice. And the choice is this. The choice is I'm going to like you. I'm not going to like you. I'm going to love you. I'm not going to love you. I'm going to serve you, but I'm not going to serve you. It's a choice. It's a sect. Mm -mm 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 -mm. You get departments in churches sometimes. Man, that's my, that's, that's my ice chest. I said, no, that's my ice chest. Don't you mess with my ice chest. I am. I am pretty. Don't you mess with That's my ice chest. Don't you even be, don't you look at my ice chest? Get your ugly eyes off my ice chest. That's my ice chest. 
I believe for the money for that ice chest, you ain't using that ice chest. Unless maybe I want to let you use the ice chest. If you ask real nice, give me a memo three weeks in advance, we'll consider it. We'll be back to you, okay? But don't you touch my ice chest. Say, it's interdepartmental. What is that? It's a division. It's a division that God didn't make. You know what? It's the kingdom's money that bought your ice chest, honey. I don't even know. I'm, I'm looking for who I'm talking to. The kingdom's money bought your ice chest. And just because you got your department name on it doesn't mean that you don't need to share. All right. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good. You know, we'll know we're really hitting this love thing when people start giving up their ice chest. And here, here, Operation Stitches, I want you to have all my ice chests. Here's my water keg. Here's the yellow one. Here's the orange one. Here's the white one. You take it all. You know what I'm talking about, Sharon? You know? That's true. I got a real big white ice chest. You seen that? It's big. You haven't been, you haven't been lusting after my ice chest now, have you? <laughs> but you've used it, though. Isn't that good? That's right. That's right. You know, you'll see some departments in some church that would never co-op on anything. It's a youth ministry thing, man. We're not going with a youth ministry thing now. I'm an adult. I'm not doing the youth ministry thing. Forget it. That's heresy. That's heresy according to this word. I think about that. There, there are churches that are like that. There are churches. That, you know what? When we partner, we catch more fish. Isn't that awesome? We partner, we catch more fish. We're on the same team. There's the resources. It all comes out of the same pot, honey. We're getting close to the end. Y'all can relax. Envying. Now he comes right out and says envying. I looked this word up. It means the feeling of displeasure produced by witnessing or hearing of the advantage or prosperity of others means ill will or spite like this the petty ill will a malicious usually small-minded desire to harm or humiliate somebody you know where that usually takes place in the mind you want to see somebody trip up you know you want to see a mess up boy that's demonic that's devilish that's earthly sensual devilish James said and you, we, we ought to be praying for one another and we ought to be provoking one another to love and good works. We ought to let our, our good works be such that God gets the glory for them. Give what you give in the name of Jesus, no strings attached. But you know what, if you envy somebody, you're not going to try to bless them. You're not going to be a channel of blessing to them. Just as I am, without one plea. But then look at this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The only law that's given to us is the law of love as New Testament believers. And you know what? Any other rule or regulation that you get that you try to put on yourself or other people gets you entangled back in that web of religion all the law and the prophets summed up in this. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Love God, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, you know, there's a whole other arm of this that we could get in tonight, but I just feel like we need to, do. we just need to rise to our feet right now. And Holy Ghost, we just pray, examine us. Not for condemnation's sake, but because we want to grow in the things of love. Father, I just pray that Tonight, if there are any of these works of the flesh that we're allowing to dominate our thinking, I just pray, Father God, that you'll move in our hearts to set us free.